Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's always a fight to get the microphone to work. Right, yeah. <laughs> and this, this computer doesn't have an inbuilt one, and I think that's the problem. Oh, yeah. yeah. Part of it. Yeah. Other than the operator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? Well, I have 3,000 words written. I have a, well, I have to write 4,000 words, but I suspect it's going to be 5,000 words by the time I'm done. <laughs> is this for what? Um, it's for a course I'm taking as a graduate course. My entire mark rests on two PowerPoints and an essay. So it's going to be 5,000 words. I'm going to do them 5,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I, now I'm at 3,000, so that's pretty good. That's good. Yeah. I'm describing some experiments now, like oh. examples. I've done techniques, and then I do examples. And then I'm going to do uh, models. of This is for mechanically testing things for viscosity and um, viscoelasticity. Yeah. How do you do that with tissue? Okay. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> my knock. You there? <laughs> oh. He was unmuted. <clears throat> you know that I think it was Ujwa wanted to talk about a paper today that they were work he was working on with um I can't remember who he's working on it with, but he was gonna present today, but I don't know if he's here yet, so uh anyways. Uh so welcome to the meeting. It's a lot smaller today. Well maybe people will come and join us later in a little bit, but um anyways I wanted to get started. Um so what did I do? The things I was going to do first here. Um, let's see. Uh, why don't I go into the submissions first? Let's see where we are with that. Let me share my screen. Okay. So I'll uh, get another person. Oh, here's Dick. Hi, Dick. Hello. So we've got a bunch of things. Uh, let's see if we have. What we have outstanding, what we have submitted. So we have the uh, the NetSci or Network 2021 uh, submissions. Uh, those the embryo networks and connectome submission was accepted, and that's being worked on right now. Um, we also have the growth form and theory of deep learning abstract that's submitted to Net Neuroscience, and if it doesn't make it. In there, we can submit it somewhere else pretty easily. We can turn around and turn it around and send it somewhere else. And also, this uh, Euler cycles for life submission to TopoNets. Which again, I got it down to a two-page uh, abstract. And so, if that doesn't make it in there, it's it's a lot easier to sort of expand out and submit somewhere else. I just you know needed to to write it up as a a document, you know. To get it in the shape of a document because it was in a presentation it was pretty unwe unwieldy um, so we have those uh, we have the mathematics of diatoms which is this uh, document here so this if we recall this is sort of a mathematics of devo worm I think I said diatoms but I'm in devo worm uh, this is the sort of the major the, the idea here are these are the major mathematical expressions one might use in some of the things that we're doing with embryos and so uh, some of these are algebraic and some of these are just graphical and the idea is to show kind of um, you know a newcomer what those are and to define those and you know we can add more to this I just had a couple here that we've, we've been working on so we have these three types of networks here, lineage trees, neural networks, node attachment, and complex networks. Um, 
and then we have this this is the model of uh, five dimensional model of the embryo and then this these are von neumann neighborhoods for cellular automata uh, you know those again we can use each of these as like a figure write some uh something underneath it describing it a little bit and why it's useful and then you know that would make some sort of uh document that we would submit somewhere um there you know we can add additional um different uh you know we can add different things into these little ovals so i'm trying to think of a, another set of equations that might be useful maybe like some sort of reaction diffusion model if we want to add that in um and so that I'm, I, you know, I'm just kind of working on this poster format just to get it into the, um, get it into the shape of like thinking about how to organize these things. So, I mean, it's not going to end up like looking like this. I might make a, we might make a poster that's a little bit less busy. But, anyways, I, I just wanted to point that out. It, it's kind of fallen off the radar, but I'm going to pick that up. We'll be picking that up this summer. Um. Bradley, you might want to add uh, the uh, uh, cellular automata patterns. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll do that. Like the different rules or things like uh, that? Yeah, the rules are one thing, yeah. The, uh, now, my first foray in that was a, uh, a stochastic uh, system with feedback in it. Okay. Okay, uh, which was not well, none of the types of bulls from uses at all. Oh, okay. yeah, something different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was basically a global local feedback system. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be good to add. Yeah, what I call the Janus faced approach. <laughs> oh, right, in that paper. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hello. Yeah, so we have Dick and Yash and Prudick and Shruti here. So hello. Uh, we we're just going over the submissions. Uh, I wanted to do that first. Uh, so we have those things. And then we have, uh, let's see, we have the Boring Billion, which is a potential book contribution. And this work is uh, about this idea of you know long-term evolution what was happening a billion years ago on earth and how did we get things like you know developmental systems or complex life um so that's that's the scope of that area boring billion specifically looks at that long period between the sort of the origin of life and then the emergence of maybe something more complex like a eukaryotic cell so there was this period of life where it was very, very simple. And why, you know, why is that? Uh, why is it the case that it was like that for so long? Yeah, George uh, Mikulowski and I published a paper on that. Okay. Oh, yeah, recently. I think I saw yeah. it. Yeah. So that's, that's a, so, you know, that's actually something we might do um, a book or, you know, Getting you know somewhere uh, moving forward on that a little bit more. Uh, also, there's this Kindle book, which is an Amazon book. This is something I think Krishna mentioned, uh, but this is for these. Um, let me make a note here. This is for the Devaworm ML stuff. So updating the Devaworm ML materials and getting those um, in some sort of form where people can access it in a book form. Um, the, let's see, uh, this ANN BNNs that was rejected by AWIFE 2021. Uh, okay, the NeurIPS uh, deadline is coming up. So I know that uh, Ojwal mentioned that he might want to present on a paper that he's doing uh, for NeurIPS. And I don't know if he's going to uh, present today or not, but he uh, said he wants to get it in by the deadline. And so... Uh, the deadline is May 19th for abstracts and May 26th for a full paper. And that may be extended a little bit. But that's, so that's the main conference. And again, like I said, it's pretty competitive. But um, it'll, you know, um, if you don't get get it in there, which, I mean, you know, you probably won't. 
um, you can submit it to one of their sort of their satellite uh, workshops are often good or you know submit it somewhere else with some reviews behind it so we'll see if, if anyone wants to submit to that uh, you know go ahead and do so but let me know what you've what you're submitting just so I can keep track of it and tell the rest of the group uh, there's this living machines conference on May 30th this is a conference on bio robotics uh, it's run uh, by the, um, a group of people a largely European uh, collaborators but they're doing a lot of different uh, workshops on these bio robotic systems and you might be interested if you have something in that area you might be interested in submitting something so I think they want uh, like a 2,000 word uh, submission by the end of the month by May 30th and you have to submit to the workshop chairs so go to the website and they have the uh, workshop chairs listed there for you you know if you find a workshop you want to submit to just submit there and you know see if they accept it um, did you let Tom Portigas know about that? Oh, yeah, I should probably let him know about that. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the main channel. Okay. Because he does a lot of stuff. He's doing a lot of stuff with the, um, like, uh, artificial bees and things like that. Uh, let's see. We have the, the test of Williamson symbiosis. So this is, again, we talked about this the other week. This is... Uh, where you have, you know, an organism that expresses different uh, modes of development uh, that come from different organisms, and so the question is, is you know, it, can you see this in its gene in an organism's genome? And you know, th there's a whole, you know, we can talk more about this. This is a little bit deeper um, sort of problem. So if you're interested, we can talk more about the background on this it requires well, a little Bradley, bit of background learning yeah Bradley, i want to remind you we have a meeting uh at 5 p.m central day, central daylight time i guess it is okay. no it's the standard time okay uh with uh augustin a statue a statue from argentina okay okay who's interested in that okay so that's yeah and then there's this uh these molecular level simulations of diatoms so the stuff that we've been doing with diatoms in this meeting has mainly been on the cellular level but there are also molecular level simulations that can be done and so that's what this entry is yeah we're talking that now <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> so that's that's a, a outstanding submission so yeah if anyone has anything to add let me know um so next, I'd like to invite anyone who wants to present. Uh, if someone wants to present something to the group, does anyone have anything? I know we had a couple things that were um, people had said they might present in a couple weeks. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, I I done myself a lot of matter regeneration things, so I have uh, that to present. Okay, go ahead. Just. Okay, Bradley. Yeah. Uh, there's one thing that's come up, which uh, you have. We need a decision from you as to whether or not to include it on the list because it, it definitely does not accept the people. Okay. And, uh, Shruti, Krishna, and I, and uh, a fellow in China, Shenzhong Zhao, uh, are beginning work on uh, uh, high resolution imaging in three dimensions of breast cancer uh, at low dose. Okay. Okay. Uh, which may get into machine learning uh, there, uh, and stuff like that, or may not. <laughs> we'll see, but it's, it's, it's certainly not Devo work stuff. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I need you to think about that uh, and uh, decide if you want to include it here. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I don't really think so. I have a lot of stuff on my plate right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, hi, Krishna, how are you? 
Hi. Hi. How are you? Pretty good. Okay. So I guess Shruti, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So like, um, last time when we talked, I was working on drawing neural cellular automata, which is not, which is based on the idea of referential model for morphogenesis. Uh, so the idea here. Oh, we lost your audio. Okay. I heard that. Uh, am I not audible? Okay. Now you're audible. Okay. 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 Just yeah. So uh, let me kind of a recap only here, but uh, initially, so the output is not just simply images in this model, but they are like virtual organisms, which are similar to living bodies that grow and respond to changes. Uh, so what the like for example, I told you that this is something that I was aiming for to work here, and uh, the problem here was to how to correctly know that what to build and what not to build and to how long do we need to train our model and where to stop. So biology had to figure out because of evolution, but what how computers and neural networks know when till till when do we have to do stuff. Uh, so we came up with the idea of cellular automata neural networks. Uh, I, I've, I've gone through these slides last time also, I'll be rushing through them this time. Uh, so yeah, we know the idea of what a cellular automata is. So uh, in, the, in this particular model, what it was that the focus was on cellular automata models as a road map for the effort of identifying cell level rules which gave rise to complex generative behavior of, uh, of the collective. For example, from a single cell, like you can see in the, in the images that come in the data styles, uh, from a single cell, how we can develop or form an organism, uh, like from a single cellular organism, how can we go to multicellular organism? That is what the basic idea of this project was. So the major task in hand is to develop an update rule starting from a single cell, how it will produce a predefined multicellular pattern in a 2D grid, right? So these were some of the previous time uh, results I showed you, but let's, uh, so this is how, how I trained my model, sorry, how I trained my model. Uh, the image on your left is the image that I have given as input. The one dot in the center is basically the starting point of the image and the watermelon that you are seeing on the right side is what we want out of the cellular automata after giving it to the model. So here you can see the stepwise after uh, uh, it did not take a lot of time because the, uh, the model was, is very small. I will show you the code snippet for that too. But you can see how slowly from a single cell, uh, it is looking at its environment. Uh, from, this, from that cell, it has eight neighbors and how it is growing. So you can see starting from a dot, we finally got a watermelon. A uh, better representation of this would be this diff, wherein you can see that how it starts from a dot and then goes on to become a watermelon slice. There are some fries, some pizza, a balloon. Probably I was too hungry while <laughs> doing this. So, uh, yeah. So, here on all these images, you can see that uh, it starts from a single point, the initial input image. That is just one pixel in the in the whole matrix, one one cell. And it grows and grows to a, to a point till it looks like, not if not exactly, because of course uh, it will require some more fine tuning, but uh, yeah, it grows to be uh, set of code where we only have two layers actually. The first one was uh, a normal convolution layer which takes us the in, uh, to 128 and then a normal uh, from 128 to 16 a very small new uh, small convolution uh, network a new here also it's a little uh, representation of what was happening from the i've taken this go this image from the paper itself so you can see from the first image if we take a single pixel from the image it actually has 16 channels the first three channels are of course rgb uh, the last the fourth channel is the transparency channel because we're using a png image and after performance of convolutions we get 
uh, and uh, after performing those formulations, use caustic air in the cell to learn the, uh, to learn the update rule and finally get the image that you have seen here. So, like I was telling you, there uh, we have used PNG images, uh, file image here, and that is particularly because uh, the object from the background because there's a background here. The blue, blue, the blue dots or the blue, blue cells or the pixels that you see here are actually the, uh, the pixels that differentiate the object from the background is transparent. So like I said before, also the first four channels in the, fir in the first layer represent the channels uh, which I mentioned above and the remaining 13 are the interpretations uh, which we as humans might not necessarily understand but they are meaning for the model for uh, understanding small semantics. Uh, so this project uh, finally provides a toy and of me doing this project. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was very good. Um, so let me see, uh, go back to your, I think the second to the last slide. The second to last slide, this yeah. one. Yeah, that one. So that was the one where you said you're talking about the channels. So this yes, is, yes. these are the inputs to the model. So is this like the training for the whole model, or is this to each cell in the grid? Uh, uh, I didn't get your question, sorry. Uh, is When you say input to the model, you mean to the entire mm -hmm. grid or each cell in the grid? Yeah, we give the entire grid in for, I mean, the whole matrix is given, and for each cell, we have 16 channels. Because each each point on the image will have 16 values that will be uh, you know, convert in the convolution layer, in the uh, convolution 2D layer, when we input in the model. All right, and then, uh, and then this 13 channels of uh, for interpretation. So, what is this like an input as well? Or uh, no, uh, these are what we derive uh, at like uh, when we when we use neural networks. There's something where each layer tries to interpret each and every. Suppose if we have uh, find out the edges, so uh, it tries to uh, you know understand the image and for its own understanding and for understanding its own update rules. This is not given as input. The input has just four channels. After those four channels, when we pass into the first convolution, where it uses 16 filters there, the total number of filters used there are 16. So amongst those 16 filters, the first four filters are what we can define. Okay, these are for red, green, blue, and the transparent channel. But the remaining uh, 12 actually, there should be 16 minus 4, 12 filters. The remaining 12 filters are something that the neural network learns on its own, and uh, uh, using that, it is able to find the object true. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, should we? Uh, can the input starting point, instead of a single cell, be any picture? The starting point should be a picture. Uh, is the picture this, I mean, related to or just any random picture? Any random picture. Uh, actually, the model, uh, the way it has been trained is for each and every single cell. So, uh, at the moment, the model which I used was for uh, training for every single cell and going across the grid. Uh, maybe if you use a, a, another image, it will first have to, you know, forget about, I mean, forget whatever is there in the image, and then it has to go to the targeted image. So it might take a little longer time, and it might be possible too. Okay, it, it reminds me, uh, are you familiar with image morphing? Yeah, I think you talked about it last time as well. Okay, more, uh, if you could, if your starting and ending pictures could be two different pictures, mm -hmm. You could then see if you could use this to morph one picture into another without using a coordinate transformation. Right, right. That could be something that we can think of. Yeah, and and then uh, if you can do that, you might want to look at the Darcy Thompson transformations. Okay. Yeah, do, you have sure. a, do you have a copy of those, uh, Brad? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I, I don't have them handy on my computer. Yeah. Yeah, I can send her something, yeah. Okay, Darcy Darcy Thompson, uh, initially around uh, 1915, uh, showed, for example, two different fish can, what, uh, of different shapes can be transformed into one another. And therefore, okay. this led to the idea of regional uh, regions of growth uh, relating the two fish. 
Uh, yeah. he, did, he did this for a few pictures. So. Yeah, that's definitely something we can look upon. Yeah, let's see. Uh, look. Okay, I'll open the chat, but it's uh, his name is. Uh, Actually, I, I have a bunch of stuff I can send her as well. And uh, I was actually, he did this actually like 100 years ago. And you know what that means? He did it without a computer. So he was able yeah. to take like... Yeah, this, he, he used grid lines. Yeah, grid yeah, lines. So, uh, but this would be a way of morphing without using grid lines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in fact, you might be able to ask, can you recover the grid lines from the process? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, having trouble typing anything in the chat for something. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have something in my hand. Anyway, you're familiar. They, he wrote two books. Uh, it was on growth and form. There was a first and second edition. Second edition was 1942, I think. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And it's a book still well, well worth reading. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, let's see. So Susan asked, uh, I have another paper I'm currently use, using to write my report for my last course. Uh, and then it's in the chat. Uh, Tissue cohesion and the mechanics of cell rearrangement. So that's in the chat. And then I guess that's. Uh, uh, I thought you could use it for um, some of your modeling, maybe. It's sort of an idea for that. So that's all. And then, uh, yeah, at Shruti, or Verdic asked, Shruti, can you please share these slides? And Shruti, you put the link in the chat. So the link is in the chat now. Looks like Thrun and Jesse have joined us as well. Hello? Uh, yeah, so, and then, you know, the other thing, too, is, like, the grid lines that Darcy Thompson used, essentially, they're coordinate systems. So I know that um, the people who applied to project number three, uh, I had two applications, and they both used different versions of coordinate systems. And so uh, that's something that, you know, we can follow up on, uh, you know, talking about, because you know, you're basically taking images and projecting them to a coordinate system. And then all that would be would be like you'd have maybe two, you know, two different sets of images, maybe two different species of embryo. You'd map those to a coordinate system and then you just compare those coordinate systems or you'd, trans, you'd make some sort of transformation from one to the other. So that's how that would work. And then you could do the same thing with cellular automata and images of an embryo. You could just you know, find major points and, and, you know, put them into a coordinate system. Once you have it in the coordinate system, then you can do the mathematical transformations in that yeah. system. And I can't remember the two systems that we had. I know Krishna was one of the applicants, and he did some work on that. But um, anyways, we'll, we'll talk more about that um, maybe next week. Um, I'll have to... Uh, pull up maybe some information, more information about that, but, okay. So does anyone else have anything else they'd like to present? Yeah, if you do a quick uh, uh, search on uh, ah. for Darcy Thompson, yeah. uh, his, uh, these things pop up right away. Okay, yeah. So, okay, for some stupid reason I can't put anything in chat. I'll put the name, yeah, I'll put the name in chat here. <laughs> Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, it's like yeah, a, there it is. Okay, now yeah. I figured it out. Okay. All right. Oh, Krishna, you, you said you were you had yeah. something to present? Okay. Yeah, sharing my screen. Okay. Is it visible? 
Not yet. Okay, lads. Okay. Okay, but I'll get to it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Network. You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. Um, you're still muted, though, Krishna. It's like it's an update on the one that he did. Uh, last week. So, am I being audible now? Yes, yes, you are. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to say something about Salamander's regeneration. So, regeneration is the regrowth of the major missing organ apart from the remaining tissue. And many other animals apart from uh, Salamander are able to regenerate platform, sea star, and mender frog, and even mice can uh, regenerate their fingertips. Even human beings can, uh, to a certain extent, can, you know, regenerate their skin, our liver gets regenerated, so there's the tips of our toes and uh, fingers, to a very small extent. So, what is salamander's regeneration? Uh, it is a process that results in the regeneration of entire limb involving complex orchestration of the limb survival cell following limb's loss. Hello? Yeah, yeah, hello. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm having a bad connection here. Okay. okay. So, first of all, uh, a clock is formed. Uh, we, uh, you know, stop bleeding at the cut side. After this, the layer of cell works too quick to quickly cover the pain of amputation, forming a structure called a wound epidermis. During the next few days, the cell of the wound epidermis grows and divides rapidly. Shortly thereafter, the cell underneath the epidermis also begins to rapidly divide, forming a cone-shaped structure known as blastoma. The cells that make up the blastoma are thought to be bone, cartilage muscle or other cells that redifferentiate, that other lost their identity, to become similar to the stem cells, which are the cells that can become one of many different kinds of cells. The blastema cells, however, have restrictions on the type of cells that they can become, for instance, a blastema cell that used to be a muscle cell can only can o Hello? Yes, hello. Sorry, some network issues on my side. Oh. Uh, can only be formed different types of muscle cells, not skin or cartilage cells. This de differentiate cells in blastema then grows and multiply, eventually adding their identity as fully developed bone or skin cells. As the blastema and its cells continue to divide, the growing structure flattens and eventually resembles a perfect copy of the lost limb, including nerves and blood vessels that are connecting to the rest of the body. So this is an uh, image of external limb regeneration. So first it's in neck type, then it has trauma, then the wound healing, that is a form of a clot to you know, prevent the loss of blood, then the stemma formation, and then the redifferentiation, and then the redevelopment. And you see that uh, apart, uh, unlike from many of the organisms that show regeneration, they don't you know usually leave a scar. So it's like as good as new so, to even begin of thinking about how we can one day be able to live into uh, lost human limbs, uh, we must, uh, you know, become familiar with the changes that salamanders undergo during re uh, regeneration. One approach that has been successful so far is discovering molecular tweaks that cause salamander to lose its regenerative ability. For example, if we can uh, know that what are the uh, molecules that we tweak out, don't let it uh, regenerate. So these are the ones that are uh, responsible for the regeneration. So 
it was it was found that the immune system uh, played an important role in the limb generation macrophages which are the cells that serve as critical role in the inflammation response after the injury so this is also an example you can see that uh, at the g uh, g level picture at the third and the fourth uh, image you can see that the blastema has been formed and now you know given the way for like the previous limb so all this previous uh, one of the uh, new method is to you know often on certain types of gene and in a uh, very layman's language if we are uh, uh, switching off uh, 50 genes and we are uh, finding out the, uh, now whether can a uh, salamander uh, can regenerate or not it can show the correlation of these 50 uh, genes with its uh, regeneration process so is uh, done with some part of its uh, nervous system like for example if uh, certain uh, parts of the nervous system are hampered before uh, giving it the wound then the wound doesn't get regenerated that specify that that certain part of the nervous system is very crucial for its regenerative process and uh, like for example nearly 2 million people lose their limbs and uh, if we are able to somehow find uh, how uh, salamanders regenerate we can uh, regenerate their limbs to a certain extent first of all we have to find what are the molecular compounds that are uh, necessary for the regeneration then we have to uh, find what are the parts of the nervous system that correspond to the regeneration and third is the cells uh, sorry uh, cells are the genes that correspond to its regeneration this is the image of regeneration so this is just after getting the wound and somewhere here the this cone like structure is the blastema and after some time uh, the limb has been generated so these are the references uh, this man's work is really great if uh, you want to get to know more about regeneration in salamander you can read his blog uh, some of my a lot of my uh, content was taken from his uh article thank you yeah that's thank great you. oh we have a bunch of things in the chat i guess okay uh so this is dick's link to darcy thompson uh young children can regenerate lost fingertips yeah there's a if you're young enough and you get your tip of your finger cut off, you can regenerate it. But of course you can't do that after a certain age and you can't re I mean, there's certain things humans can regenerate like skin and, yeah. you know, uh, healing liver. of different organs. Liver. Yeah. Liver. Yeah. liver. Even, uh, like mice, even, uh, it happens in frogs, uh, that pool can regenerate, but a young, uh, adult frog can't. Yeah. So, so you know it's like there's something about like age and the type of organ that it is or maybe what the sort of the molecular program of the cell is so like liver is pretty what they call pluripotent which means it's sort of its gene expression profile is a lot closer to say what you would find in a stem cell or in a cancer cell uh than the rest of your organs so the regenerative potential is maybe a little bit higher And they don't it know. Might be, it, it might correlate with puberty. It could be, yeah. A lot of hormonal activity. I was activity. reading an article, and it was they were suggesting that uh, when a pregnant woman, uh, woman gets, you know, uh, organ damage, if uh, she's having the fetus, it sells brain uh, stem cells for uh, it to repair. Right. Yeah. It was currently a study, not very well established, but they were suggesting that fetus sells uh, sends stem cells to the mother. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, even in our brain, we do regenerate neurons. And there's been a debate about that in the human brain, but in, I guess in other brains as well, that there's, in the human brain, there's some uh, regeneration of cells uh, where there's neurogenesis, of course, in like develop, early development. And then at some point it stops, but they found that there's 
also neurogenesis in adulthood to some extent and there's a big debate about that and of course that's that's something that uh you know is another form of plasticity aside from like synaptic plasticity that you can see so i mean there are a lot of different this is a pretty interesting area and people are always trying to figure out like you know obviously if you could regenerate your limbs or damaged organs or whatever it would be great <laughs> but <laughs> people are still trying to figure out how that works and so the yeah, well, yeah. one way of putting the question is if axolotls can do it and axolotls are similar to a common ancestor with them why can't we do it yeah <laughs> okay and uh one of the big problems there is spinal cord regeneration for example axolotls can do it we can't yeah Okay, so anybody who has a back injury that leads to paralysis, if they were an axolotl, they'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I make this slide just feel like I'm writing a script for a sci fi movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, all the sucks we wrote a book on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I have something on that in a little bit, so stay tuned. Uh, yeah, so like the, with respect to the spinal cord injury, I mean, the way they've done it, they've tried to do this in humans by like creating these matrices where they'll put in like all sorts of growth factors and different types of cells, and then they'll put it actually like a spinal block into the individual. They, they've done this in mice a lot, but they're also trying to do it in humans. And so the idea would be that there's like some spinal cord injury where the spinal cord is severed, and they put in this... Uh, this region, you know, this implant where they have all these growth factors and things uh, that are sort of setting up a bunch of signals so that the uh, cord can uh, regenerate across that gap. And the whole idea is they think that, you know, if you stimulate the spinal cord enough, the cells in the spinal cord, that they'll start to regenerate and sort of move like, you know, how our nerves and axons usually do in development, where they start to migrate towards each other and make a connection. And so they, they try to do all this sort of uh, mimicry through, you know, like biogels and things like that. Um, but, you know, and it's it's been of limited success, but, you know, that's, they're trying to figure out the key to, you know, how to sort of facilitate this in humans uh, other than just having the natural ability. So, you know, um, we had a project which unfortunately never got off the ground uh, to, uh, uh, cause a spinal cord injury in an axle and also in a mouse and then follow them by NMR imagery and see when they diverge. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In other words, you know, when did the process stop in the mouse and continue in the axle? Yeah. Well, you can then be human. <laughs> I don't think you'll find many volunteers. Yeah. <laughs> Should they be interested? <laughs> so the, let's see. Uh, okay. yeah. Krishna says, is there enough data to create a differentiation tree for regeneration and compare it to normal embryogenesis? So I don't, no. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I guess the question is, is like, do we have like a way to look at the cells as they sort of have that, they form that blastemic cap and then they sort of start to like, you know. Well, well, for instance, if, if muscle cells only produce different kinds of muscle cells, you could call that a branch of a differentiation tree. Okay. And you could compare that to the normal production of those and see if if the regeneration is following the same differentiation tree or something else, but it's obviously following some kind of tree if it's restricted. Right. Okay, so the question is, out of that, out of those experiments, can one tease out data to figure out a tree? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then... Uh... Jesse said, I wondered about that. I guess that's in res with respect to like regeneration. Yeah, it was about the, you know, um, I, I just kind of followed up on that thing. Like, I, I wondered about like why embryogenesis versus just specific things and the nature of it. So the, I guess the, the way you're talking about the, the trees of what and how and why 
you know, I'm always interested in those trajectories of stuff and the decisions that are forced in the world. Yeah. I mean, we can talk more about that um, later. I mean, we can actually, I don't know if, uh, how are your drawing skills? <laughs> I guess that's the question. Yeah, see, one way of looking at it is to say, okay, if you've had an injury, some cells under somehow understand that and they go backwards down the differentiation tree and then they come back up. That's that will be one model for regeneration. Or they do something entirely different. You know, whether regeneration is the same as normal embryogenesis has never been resolved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the same, it's a similar thing with uh, metamorphosis because in metamorphosis you get cells that are differentiated uh, and then they de differentiate oh, yeah. and they re differentiate. Well, may, yeah, they may, they may be differentiate and regenerate, or they may be a reserved group of cells that just go on like stem cells. Yeah. It could, it could be. Later. Uh, yeah. Uh, how much flows are uh, salamander to jellyfish? How much what? How much phylogenic, uh, phylogenically close they are to the jellyfish? The jellyfish? <laughs> that goes back to the boring billion, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty far. It's pretty distant. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. Like they're amphibians and they are fish so somewhat. No, the fish are superior because they have many eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah. then Susan. It's probably not work on regeneration jellyfish, but I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Uh, Susan says nerve tissue bio ink. This is a startup in University of Victoria uh, called Axolotl Incorporated that produces the BioLink. So I guess this is a method for inducing regeneration or? Sorry, I don't know exactly. They've um, produced a BioLink that actually grows neural tissue, neural tissue where the paint seems to fail. So they've, they've got, um, um, I don't know, nerve stimulation molecules in them, um, and they found a certain size of colloid works better along with the nerve tissue, and they can print the bioink. Anyway, they are working with other people who make bioinks, and they're really interested in their ink because it works, or the nerve tissues grow in their ink where it doesn't in others. So it was an interesting uh, um, talk that she gave to our, our bioengineering group. That was pretty uh, good. I'll, I'll find you more yeah. if you want. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, and then Jesse says, I'd be interested in that kind of tree finding or functionality of regeneration. Yeah, we can talk more about that. Um, and then uh, Krishna uh, Shruti says, Krishna, you were the one with the back issues. You'd be a better match. So that was referring to regenerating spinal cord or whatever. Uh, Jesse says, volunteering versus volunfolding or voluntolding. Yes. The difference between someone volunteering uh, and being told to volunteer. <clears throat> yeah. And then I had a slightly dark comment about it. I think many of these issues in your experiments probably fall into the Voluntary category, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I mean, well, a lot of people, like, if you're, like, there are a lot of people with, like, severe, you know, yeah. uh, degenerative diseases, and a lot of them try different things, like, they want, you know, you, you, would, you would try anything to sort of regain your function or to stay alive, and sometimes people, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of times it's ethical, you know, and sometimes it's experimental, and Sometimes people are just not ethical about it. So it's like the, especially in like stem cell uh, biology, there are some people who are not as, uh, you know, so, I, and, yeah. and, you know, there's a whole set of issues there. Uh, Dick said, how about your regeneration paper cited? So can you, uh, Krishna, can you create a list of 
Well, I think you had the list there of the papers, but can yeah. you get it into a more formal format? That'd be great. Yeah. I okay. So I wanted to go, actually, I wanted to go to the papers now. Um, and I have something that we just were talking about axolotl and I found something else about axolotl. So this is kind of a follow up here. It's about metamorphosis of axolotls. So this is a old paper by Julian Huxley in Nature, 1920. It's metamorphosis of axolotl caused by thyroid feeding. So this isn't regeneration, but this is actually where you're sort of at a certain point in development and you feed the, uh, you feed the axolotl a uh, certain type of food and it metamorphoses into a different phenotype. So the fact that a diet of mammalian thyroid will induce frog tadpoles to metamorphose uh, precociously into the adult form is now well established. This is in 1920. It is of some interest to find that this diet produces a similar effect in a form which does not metamorphose, the axolotl. This is a larvae of a salamander known as amblystoma, but is remarkable in being neo uh, neonetic, meaning that it normally fails to metamorphose and entails full size and sexual mat maturity while keeping its larval characters, which means it doesn't go through a stage where it transforms its phenotype. Uh, chief among those are the external gills and fin along the back and both borders of the tail, but also the adult also differs from the larvae in color and the shape of the head and the development of the eyes and eyelids and the rounded form of the tail. And of course, its uses of limbs for, for progression on land. And then this was something that, um, so this person said, uh, if you feed axolotls a diet of mammalian thyroid tissue, they permanently metamorphose into something which looks a lot like a tiger salamander, even though in nature its entire species is neotenous. So they, that paper sort of described the neoteny part of it where the axolotl doesn't go through this metamorphic stage. In this case, if they're eating this diet, this special diet, they actually do metamorphose into a different phenotype. And so this is the phenotype that it has. And I think we've, seen, well, Kristen showed some pictures of the axolotl uh, under normal circumstances, but this is the metamorph metamorphic version of the axolotl. So that, I mean, I thought I'd bring that up because it was a, it's an interesting thing. We're talking about regeneration, but there's also this issue of metamorphosis and uh, metamorphosis is an interesting topic. That's just one form of it. There are other forms where, like I said, the, you know, there's a lot of remodeling that goes on even more extensively than that. Like you can think of the butterfly, and, you know, going from a caterpillar to a butterfly that requires a lot of like sort of remodeling of the phenotype. And so this happens in a cocoon stage. And basically what's happening is you have, uh, you know, cells that de-differentiate other cells that are uh, sort of reserved stem cells that differentiate not in the first stage of development, but in the second stage of development. And so, um, you know, that's another area that, you know, uh, when we talk about regeneration, there's also this metamorphic um, aspect to, to it as well. Yeah. Well, there's another interesting thing about the butterfly story. Yeah. And then the brain, apparently, by behavioral studies, is transferred from the chrysalis to the adult. Oh, wow. In yeah. other words, the brain does not metamorphose. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah. So a butterfly can remember being a crystal. Right. And of course, the, the stuff that Michael Levin has done with uh, with flatworms, uh, you know, that he's been able to take, like, uh, in a flatworm, you can uh, just blow away everything but a single cell. And then the single cell can become a new flatworm. But what's interesting is those flatworms have like this associative memory that's retained, even if you just take a single cell of the old flatworm and regenerate a new flatworm. So, I mean, maybe that suggests that there's some sort of molecular basis for uh, memory, or you know, that there's something. Well, in, this, in the case of a of a butterfly, what's going on in its neural cells? Uh, that there's, you know, it's retaining some information throughout this process, so. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's something I just said in the chat. Like uh, the, I'm, I'm one of the things in the back of my mind that is about maybe I don't know if it's technically detailed as, as Levin's stuff, even though like this what is what is a memory in that sense, but uh, how it'd be really interesting like, if I could you know create a perfect imaginary wonderful experience it, like I would, it would be nice to track some things in in the caterpillar to the butterfly brain uh, along the line of like affordances and, and what the perception of what they can do is obviously you know insects only have so much capacity to like it's it's all like kind of you know direct perception anyway what, what can they what can they Represent in a beyond the and forward of the sense, but but still, I think that concept is really interesting and has a lot of carried over into, you know, whole human stuff, VR stuff, and yeah. Well, yeah, we can. Yeah, we well, let's put a pin in that, and I would uh, <laughs> see. Yeah, uh, there's also some evidence in uh, in some salamander. I don't think it was X model that you can, uh, if you train the animal to avoid dark and then take a piece of its brain and trans transfer it to a normal adult, uh, the normal adult will also avoid dark. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was done about 1975 and never followed up. Hmm. That's pretty good, yeah. Was, I don't I mean, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> well... Yeah. Uh, Susan says, I might be able to image the butterfly metamorphosis with OCT. So OCT is which one? Which microscope is that? Or? Uh, optical coherence tomography with uh, infrared light. Okay. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, yeah. So let's see. I'll go to another paper here. Uh we had some, actually, I wanted to mention this. I don't know if Shruti saw this yet. So there was that paper she just presented on, the one on neural cellular automata. And I posted this in the Slack this week. This is the follow-up paper on that. So this is the adversarial reprogramming of neural cellular automata. And uh, this is uh, this is where they take those uh, neural CA models and they use uh, adversarial data. To train them, so they use different types of uh, inputs that are adversarial, meaning that they're intentionally sort of cryptic or they're intentionally wrong. And so this is, of course, we do this in neural networks to, uh, you know, train them against attacks or against false positives. And so adversarial, so they have an adversarial MNIST cellular automata here. So they have. Um, they introduce information, not just the training information that looks like the training set, but examples that aren't explicitly aren't supposed to be part of the training set, but they're they're used as sort of part of the training set. So, you know, an eight is what you maybe what you would achieve as a desired morphology, but maybe like a, um, a, a seven that looks kind of like a T you know, that that's not really what we want. So you would introduce that as well, and then the system would have to differentiate between, say, something like that and like an actual seven. So this is, uh, this kind of goes through a lot of this. They're, they're doing this. Uh, they say in this experiment, the goal is to create an adversarial CA that can hijack the cell's collective classification consensus to always classify an eight. So in this case, they're, using eight as a way to like sort of hijack what the cells are doing. So no matter what the cell is encountering, it's always classifying an eight for some reason. And this is, of course, if you had like a, you know, um, I mean, you can even think of it in the biological context. If a cancer, you know, a bunch of cancer cells wanted to hijack um, the biological system in a, in a, in a, in an organism, to take over or a virus wanted to hijack the DNA replication machinery of a cell. You know, those are kinds of adversarial attacks on the on the biological system. So they're they're kind of looking at this problem and I think it's really ingenious because it's 
you know, I mean, we don't really think about uh, things like I just mentioned as adversarial attacks, but they really are um, on a biological system. And then how do you model that in something that you can see like the output? This is a really interesting uh, extension of this work. So I don't know, Shruti, this is a distill article. I don't know if we have the link here. Oh, here's the link. So I'll put this in the chat. And anyone, you know, this is for everyone. Um, okay, so Dick asked, uh, can you, or Jesse asked, can you share the paper Shruti shared before? This is the first paper here. So Shruti gave a link there. And Dick put this link into the braid transplantation and salamanders paper from 1969. And then this is the link to the follow-up to the growing neural soil or automata paper. So that's, cool. uh, was that? No, I just want to pull up all the papers, uh, the brain one and, and the other. I'm going to look at all the papers, actually. Yeah, yeah. So that's the, oh, OK. Um, so then next is going, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, this is a series of papers that I think Dick sent me this paper um, the other day this one here, and this is uh, Physical Laws Shape of Pox Gene Colli uh, Collinearity. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to back up here before I get into this, and I'm going to go through a thing I prepared. It's a thing I drew up on a Wacom tablet, so it's a little bit uh, sloppy, but that's okay. Um, so this, this is like really <laughs> busy, but I think you can get the idea here, is that we're going to be talking about something called the body plan. And the body plan goes back to the German term Bauplan, which is this idea that there are certain sort of architectures that uh, emerge in development that define certain groups of organisms. And so uh, there are uh, a, a small, you know, relatively small number of body plans in the tree of life relative to all the diversity that we see. And so these are conserved throughout evolution. So there's a common origin to each body plan and those body plans emerge pretty early in evolution, as it turns out. They emerge some, somewhere back in, you know, um, uh, pretty far back, you know, at least several million years to hundreds of millions of years. They don't have any incentive to change because they're successful solutions to certain the things. Thing they're trying to reach. And so the, the question that comes up here is that you have this, you know, how do you, why is this conserved and how does this sort of map to the genetic substrate? So here's a segmented organism here. This is like some sort of segmented organism. And you can see these circles and they're lettered A through E. And so these lettered uh, circles are genes that are uh, ordered, in, they, they exist in the genome in a certain order and they map to these different body segments. So A maps to the head, B maps to this segment, C maps to this segment, D and E. So all these map to certain segments in the organism. They have this physical linkage, so they all have to be in this order. And this is what they call collinearity. I misspelled it, but, um, but that's okay. Uh, this, is, this is the basic idea. So when I talk about these papers, keep this sort of stuff in mind as we go through these papers. Um, so the first one here is this um, physical law shape of pox gene collinearity. And so I just mentioned what collinearity was. It's this idea that these, there are these genes that are in a certain order on the chromosome and they get expressed and they uh, are expressed uh, and they form these different segments. And the reason that they're arrayed in this order is because they have to exhibit what they call physical linkage, which is where they're linked physically on the chromosome. And this prevents them from being separated by recombination during uh, recombination events. And so it keeps these things together and it keeps the organism from having their segments all thrown around in different parts of the body. And as I, I think I said in the, in the, uh, on the board here, uh, order equals fitness. So this collinearity, this this physical linkage, is actually it enforces this fitness. So if you move the head, say to the middle, it, the organism would not 
be able to survive because you know you can't really have a head in the middle and survive these things have to be in a certain order so um so this paper kind of gets into this idea that maybe phys physics has a role to play here so uh, Hox gene collinearity is a multiscalar property of many animal phyla particularly important in embryogenesis it relates entities and events occurring in Hox clusters which are those clusters of genes that I showed you with the circles inside the chromosome DNA and in embryonic tissues. These two entities differ in linear size by more than four orders of magnitude. Um, this Hox gene collinearity is observed as spatial collinearity when the Hox genes are located in the order Hox 1, Hox 2, Hox 3. So they're all sort of ordered in that sequence. Um, and then corresponding sequence of ontogenetic units. So the ontogenetic units are basically the mapping to the uh, different segments of the organism. So that's this E1, E2, E3. And so this is located along the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. As you saw, you go from the head to the tail. Um, so expression of Hox1 occurs in E1, Hox2 and E2 and so forth. Besides this uh, spatial collinearity, a temporal collinearity has also been observed in many vertebrates. So this means that there's a collinearity in terms of time. So that means that in this case, the first Hox1 or this first module, Hox1 is expressed in E1, and then later on, Hox2 is expressed in E2, followed by Hox3 is expressed in E3. So that means that what happens in this diagram is that this A gene is expressed first, and this whole thing is like a single unit, you know, it's in the embryo, but the A gene is expressed first. So the head is the genes that define the head are expressed first and then the genes that define the second segment are expressed next and so you get this definition from head and then eventually to tail where the cells are sort of uh, given the signals to differentiate and form structure so that's what they're finding here they, they use a biophysical model to test this um, they say, according to the biophysical model, physical forces are created which pull the Hox genes one after the other, driving them to a transcription factory domain which, in which they are transcribed. And this is a lot of molecular biology jargon, but basically the Hox genes are pulled as a, in, in, during their expression into the machinery and they're, uh, done, this is done sequentially. Um, so this is a, um, this is a simulation study and they're just kind of trying to test some of these ideas. Um, symmetry is a physical mathematical property of matter that was explored in depth by no other formulated that a groundbreaking theory that applies to all sizes of matter. Uh, and then they just kind of talk about this. Uh, so they use that as a way to uh, use Hox gene collinearity. It explains the origins of this, uh, not only along the AP axis like I showed you, but also in animals of circular symmetry. And there are all sorts of marine invertebrates that have circular symmetry. So instead of having this uh, anterior posterior symmetry, they also have a circular symmetry where this head and tail meet. And then there would be like maybe fourfold symmetry where you'd have, you'd divide your circle up into different, um, you know, slices. And then each of those slices would be, uh, they would correspond to a certain Hox gene. So that's the idea. And so they get into this, they kind of show their work here. They show an example in this figure. They show concentration of the gene product from each Hox um, gene. They show, you know, other things here. They kind of show this at the micro scale and macro scale. Um, and then they, uh, they have this uh, elastic spring expansion model for uh, their physical model. And then they show, okay, then they show the circular organization of echinoderms as an example of, circ you know, the circular symmetry. They show the Barnsley leaf as a self-similar design. So the idea being that, like, if I took this, and this wasn't shown in this figure too much, but if you go to the Barnsley fern, which or Barnsley leaf, which is a fractal structure, you can imagine each one of these segments having their own set of Hox genes, which is a little bit 
I don't know if that actually happens in nature, but they're using this as an example. So, you know, each of these branching uh, mechanisms would be a Hox gene, and then each of these branching mechanisms would have, it would have the same Hox gene, but it would have a different expression pattern. And so you can, you know, uh, you can repurpose these Hox genes for different scales of, of morphogenesis. So that's all I wanted to talk about that paper. The other one I wanted to talk about then is this uh, paper, Development of Origin of Animal Body Plans. And so again, I, like as I said, the body plan is comes from this term Bauplan, which is a German term, and the German embryologist coined it to describe these basically uh, very similar types of organization across large uh, parts of the tree of life. And so they, this paper is pretty long, but uh, they talk a lot about, they kind of lay out some of these factors. They talk about Hox clusters, which are these groups of Hox genes. They talk about head formation, eye formation, patterning, and this kind of gets really deep into the technical aspects of uh, how these uh, Hox genes and how these types of mechanisms relate to body plans and sort of the, the development of body plans. So it um, doesn't have a, a quick uh, abstract to show, but uh, yeah, it kind of goes through a lot of this. Um, it kind of talks about, you know, kind of puts the body plans in a phylogeny, so in a tree where they have different uh, taxa uh, which are each maybe, you know, hundreds of thousands of species in each of these categories and how they branch off. And then a body plan is a shared characteristic of some of these groups. And so you can see where they're sort of conserved amongst groups, large groups of organisms. And so, um, and then of course here you have major developmental innovations leading to the origin of bioteria. So one of these body plans comes with a bunch of innovations that occur at different points in the tree of life so you have these different uh fact these different things that sort of enable um development of bioteria and then that enables these body plans to emerge um yeah so this is a pretty long in involved paper but i i wanted to mention it because they do go through a lot of different types of tissue uh morphogenesis and, and other things um, in in this same vein, in the same vein as this model. So, um, and then finally, I wanted to see if we have anything else in here I wanted to talk about. Um, maybe I will talk about this. Uh, so this is a blog post that came up um, this week, and this is uh, on the nodes. So this is something that we've talked about in the past, we published a blog post on this. This is a blog run by the Society for Developmental Biology. And uh, this, this blog post talks about uh, embryo morphogenesis is a play whose outcome is, result, is the result of a complex and delicate plot made of balances and agreements among many actors. The execution of the genetic program, biochemical communication among cells, mechanical forces, energy consumption, geometry, and all this other stuff. Um, this process is by no means smooth, and in some developmental stages, dramatic sudden shifts in the properties of the structure of the embryo occur. So they talk about this, um, they, this is sort of their uh, research experience. Um, they're talking about some of these sudden shifts and, and how they're uh, investigating some of these. Um, and so they you know, they kind of talk about their case. And actually they get into this issue of phase transitions. So these sudden shifts, they're characterizing them as what they call in physics phase transitions. And I know we've talked about that in the group before, um, but they're taking this tool from physics called phase transitions, and they're using it to interpret these shifts in uh, embryogenesis. And so they talk about this. And so um, I don't want to get too much more into this, but um, they, they do give a good example of what a phase transition looks like in the embryo. So in this case, they're looking at, um, I think they mentioned it up here, where they talk about 
the, the specific place in embryogenesis where they observe one of these shifts. Um, and so, uh, one of, yeah, so their interest, one of their interests is one of the targets of our research was to establish how tissue material properties change in space and time within the zebrafish embryo at the onset of morphogenesis. So at this stage, the embryo is composed of a few thousand cells in what they call the blastoderm, sitting on top of a yolk cell. The blastoderm starts spreading and engulfing the yolk, defining the onset of gastrulation. And so they're looking at blastoderm viscosity. They know the viscosity of the embryo tissue drops by more than an order of magnitude when morphogenesis starts. So this, when the cells invade the yolk and take it over, there's this sort of tra phase transition from a solid non-deformable state to a fluid highly deformable one. And so that's their sort of motivating issue. And then they apply this model of phase transitions to it. And they have a number of different papers here. So if this is an area you're interested in, there's a nice bibliography here. And they also have some of the papers that they're referring to in here. So this is, um, I don't know, if the link is in this PDF, oh, here it is. So it's here. I'll just uh, put it put it in the chat for you. And so there it is. And then let me go through the uh, chat messages here. We have a couple. Uh, all right, so Yash said, I had to leave now. Thank you, Shruti, for sharing slides. Have a great week. Thank you, Yash, for attending. Vrudik also has to go. It was an amazing presentation, Shruti. So again, thank you, Vrudik. Uh, Susan says, I'll get you a review paper on phase transitions, tissue rheology and embryonic organization. So uh, yeah, thanks. you should send me that. And then this is the link to the Node uh, blog post. So I think that's all for today. Uh, if we have any comments before we go. Um, I just wanted to tell Dick that I finally found uh, the cell sorting information that we've been talking about, and uh, I put the reference in the chat. That was uh, the uh, tissue cohesion and the mechanics of cell rearrangement, and it, it quotes you, uh, it quotes Dick, um, and also, um, of course, Bradlin, but also um, oh, the, the new physicist, um, she, Manning, Lisa Manning. So it's interesting. I'm, I'm quoting Lisa Manning quite a few times in this paper I'm writing. Maybe I'll try to give you a presentation sometime. I have to, I have to finish it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, anything else before we go? Thank you again, Shruti and Krishna, for presenting. Um, oh, we have two more comments in the chat. Oh, that was bye. Okay, the run is leaving. Bye. Okay, uh, so thanks for attending. Have a good week. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, Shruti. That was very interesting.